What's up, SEO pros? Big news! I recently discovered SEO Nitro, and let me tell you, it's a game changer. In just days, I saw incredible results that blew my mind. With SEO Nitro, you can get links from thousands of different C block IPs, the most powerful links at a fraction of the cost. The patent software lets you control your entire backlink profile in minutes. Add, remove, and change links at any time. Protect your site from Google's changes with SEO Nitro's revolutionary backlinking software. Imagine having the power to have laser targeted theme backlinks, automated link spinning, set it and forget it. Thousands of stellar sites and manual and automated posting options. SEO Nitro is the ultimate SEO weapon. Head on to SEOnitro.com now to revolutionize your SEO game. Don't miss out on page one. It's just click away. Hey, what's up everyone? Happy Friday. Happy Good Friday, everyone. Today we have a very special guest, Daniel Foley Carter, and we'll be learning how to recover from algorithm updates. It couldn't come at a great time with everyone getting hit, and a lot of you guys getting hit by the March core and spam updates. So I think this is a great time for us to see how we can recover from algorithm updates, prevent our sites from getting hit by algorithm updates. Daniel has a lot of great tips. If you're not following him on LinkedIn, be sure to follow him on LinkedIn. So, if it's too late for you to fly out to SEO Spring Training in Scottsdale, Arizona, I believe you can you can get the uh, live you can watch it live streaming. I'm not sure if it's going to be recorded, but you can watch it live streaming. I put the link into the li live chat for the live streaming. If you want to check out uh, SEO Spring Training live stream if you can't fly out next week, which reminds me that I will not have an episode next week because I will be at SEO Spring Training. I look forward to sharing some of the nuggets I find and learn about and also a recap video of all the speakers and all the attendees. Be sure to say hi to me when you are at SEO Spring Training. Get you on camera. Have a drink. I see a bunch of you out there. Don't be shy, guys. Say hi. Let me know where you're watching from. Ernesto. Yo, yo, yo. Victor. Happy Friday. Breeze alive, what's up? <laughs> Ernesto, yo, 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 what's up, Ernesto? <laughs> if you're just tuning in, we have Daniel Foley Carter, and we'll be talking about how to recover from Google, Google algorithm updates. Posts a lot on LinkedIn. I kind of gathered a lot of his um, insights and developed them and turned them into questions. So you can kind of share them here on the live stream. If you're watching on LinkedIn or on Twitter, be sure to come over to YouTube if you have any questions and ask them in the live chat. We got about six more minutes to go. I see a bunch of you out there. Don't don't be shy. Say hi. What's up, everyone? How y'all doing? What's up, Kenneth? I'm doing awesome. It's a little gloomy over here in the Bay Area.
Fletcher says, perfect timing for this episode. Yes, sir, it is. Always good to get refreshed on how to recover from algorithm updates and even also how to prevent yourself from getting hit by algorithm updates. I believe it's a holiday weekend for a lot of us. I know in the UK you guys have this bank holiday. It's what? We have Easter here. Happy Good Friday, guys. Oh, I see Daniel calling in. Let me make sure he can hear us and we can hear him. Luther says, hello. <laughs> Daniel, can you hear us or can you hear me? I can't see you though. Daniel, I can't see you. If, uh, can you? Is your? Can you hear me? I can't. There we go. Lovely, Daniel. Looking good. Thank you for coming by. Wait, can Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, I can't hear you though. You're okay. Stefan, my man. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Oh, yeah. Now? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Love it. Sound good. Look good. Love the hair. You got a nice fresh cut there, I see. I <laughs> love it. Yeah, yeah, just gonna hit today. <laughs> I know, I was like, I had a great haircut today too. I was like, oh man, I was ready for the episode. <laughs> Love it. Kobe says, hey, Daniel and Dre. Hey, Kobe, how are you? You're well, my friend. Oh yeah, rayhom.com. Yo, Dre, I made it to a live session this time, right? Yes, sir, this is live. If you're just tuning in, we have Daniel Foley Carter, and we'll be learning how to recover from algorithm updates. It comes at a great time with uh, this recent sp spam and core updates. We'll learn how to prevent ourselves from getting hit, and maybe even recover, you know, and recover from it. I've gathered all the great insights from Daniel's LinkedIn posts. Be sure to follow him on LinkedIn. He posts this regularly. So what you're here going to be talking about will be stuff he shares on LinkedIn. So great stuff there. Be sure to follow him. Oh, I see. Is that is that a beer you got going on there? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the weekend and it's late here in the UK, so love it. We got one more, but we got about one more minute, guys. Thank you, Daniel, for coming in while it's being late there. I know it's a holiday weekend. It's fine, it's fine, my friend. All right, love it. Maddox says, what's up, Dre and Daniel? What's up, Maddox? <laughs> All right, Daniel, so I'm gonna uh, um, go ahead and put you on mute real quick, and about eight minutes after I'm done introducing the videos, uh, I'll get you, I'll introduce you right in. All right. Inning 2024. 
Want to unlock the keys to search engine dominance in 2024? The 5th Annual SEO Spring Training Conference returns April 3rd through 7th in Scottsdale, Arizona. Join hundreds of search engine marketers and leaders to get the latest strategies, tactics, and insights to boost your SEO success. Attend over 40 sessions on topics like advanced SEO techniques, AI optimization, local SEO, and more. Actual takeaways from renowned industry professionals leading the way in SEO innovation. And most importantly... Yeah, yeah. Hey, time to get it started. No delay. Let's work. Wanna see you be an SEO expert? Paul Andre Devera, steady dropping knowledge. Over 15 years in the game, so he knows all about it. Master the art of SEO. You will be amazed. Time to get your brand off page to on page. Dropping knowledge, legendary for sure. Whether you're just getting started or self-employed entrepreneur. Yeah, let's go. Subscribe to the SEO video show. Hey. Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of the SEO Video Show, where SEO is alive and fun. My name is Paul Andre DeVera, a.k.a. Dre, and I curate SEO videos released within the past week into about one-minute clips. My favorite part of the show is when I get to introduce my guest, and my guest this week is the one and only Daniel Foley Carter. Before we get started, let's say hey, what's up to everyone in chat. I see Maddox, Kobe, Ray, Stefan, Chauncey, Luther, Fletcher, Kenneth, Ernesto, Breeze Alive. Welcome, everyone. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Now let's get on with the show. Hey Dre, what kind of fruit do SEOs like best? Low hanging fruit. <laughs> Google recently published a new episode of Search Off the Record to discuss the importance of understanding what users seek to accomplish and optimizing accordingly rather than focusing solely on metric scores. Listen along, the search team touches on metrics like uh, LCP, Largest Contentful, contentful Paint, uh, columnar Layout Shift, CLS, and the latest interaction Next Paint as pieces of the pie for a better user experience. The link of the podcast is in the description. SEO Truths shares his insights on how to beat the Google March update. Let's check what he says, Adam. Since online reputation management is now taking the place of Google, and this is my own thought process and theory based on evidence that we're seeing in this video, I found that online reputation management is establishing and managing a positive perception of a business. It covers encouraging positive reviews, tracking brand mentions, and responding to users' comments on social media, product review websites, and other platforms. Is it so implausible that if this matters to users, this metric of online reputation, then why wouldn't it matter to Google? And so if you want my top advice, here's what I would do. Number one, I would look through whether or not you are having this problem by searching your own brand through Google and seeing how robust the results are. Number two, I would start building up third-party mentions of your brand in all of the places that it matter because clearly it is getting a much higher priority within Google's ranking systems than I originally anticipated. And number three, I would stop thinking about backlinks as just having a link to your website, but more so having a brand mention to your website from various trusted sources where people are talking about you. Once Google started... Um favoring big brands it became very important to build your own brand it's it's more important than ever with this whole gener google generative search experience with that said here's how to build a brand trust by randy Rody. let's take this one set remember that understanding consumer hesitations gives us power utilizing multiple platforms enhances our visibility while showcasing authenticity and brings us closer to those we aim to serve all bolstered by fostering genuine emotional connections that transform customers into loyal brand advocates so if we've explored the foundational pillars of building trust in your brand from understanding the hurdles that prevent customers from connecting with us to employing a suite of digital strategies like press releases that bridge these gaps, it's clear that fostering trust isn't just beneficial, it's the essential for long-term success and lead generation. Building brand loyalty through emotional connections, leveraging transparent communication, and ensuring your online presence showcases your credibility are not overnight tasks. Cultivating these relationships based on mutual respect and understanding takes patience and persistence. 
Many of you know I'm a huge fan of press releases. I mean, it was an SEO secret weapon like 15 years ago and still works like a charm today for backlinks and getting your brand mentions. I started discussing uh, creating my own affiliate site, but I'm still figuring out my own niche. Julian Goley shares key considerations before committing to a niche. Let's check this one out. And before you go ahead, right, there's a few other things that you need to realize. So number one is can you actually produce the best content on that topic? Because it might be like low DR sites can compete, but it's because their content is really, really good. Another one is do you have enough EAT, right? So are you an expert or can you find an expert to actually create and write the content? This is becoming more and more important. So for example, I ran this poll yesterday. It's already got 89 votes right here. And you can see how important EAT is becoming when it comes to ranking in the eyes of most FTOs. So if you can't produce any signs of expertise, authoritativeness, experience and trust on your website, it's going to be very, very difficult to actually rank. And one other thing I would say is like, can you actually commit to this project, right? So I see loads of SEOs just start loads of different websites, but they don't make money from any of them. Final thing I would say is give seven days to two weeks before going ahead, right? This is probably the most important decision you're going to make when it comes to SEO and your website. And if you just rush into it, that you might have like one year of work to do without getting any results. So that Check out the whole video to see the other methods that he talks about, about finding a profitable niche. Kyle Roof shares the most crucial insight on EEAT. Let's check this one out. You know, the whole thing with eat, you know, going back, uh, in fact, a medic all the way back was to make yourself real, you know, like make yourself as real as you can and make yourself as real as you can to a bot. And that hasn't changed. Now, what we understand that to be from Google's perspective, that has changed a little bit and our, our knowledge has expanded on what perhaps they're looking for. But really, as I said before, the framework you need to have is, okay, there's my company's online, but that company over there is, is a brick and mortar. What are they doing? What do they look like? Mm -hmm. You know, and then look for things that are online to make yourself look like that as much as you can. And that's, I think the right framework to think about these things, make yourself real, make yourself yeah. real that a bot can find that, that it's not. Not that a human can look and be like, oh, this is a great website, I get it, this is, all right. But that a bot can make that evaluation through the different signals that it can find, that's really the, the most important thing. If I had to summarize the last hour, I would say be real and be a brand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, um, yeah, get, get conversion on your site. Make it so that people can convert there, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that might be. Uh, yeah. But the more of that you can do, I think the better. With all these algorithm updates, it's been apparent that we all need to build that brand authority. But if you got hit with an update, my guest will show us how to recover and um, be algorithm update proof. Which brings me to my favorite part of the show. Please ask questions on the topic and I will address them in the order that they are received. But before we get started, here is a word from our sponsor. Are you struggling to get high authority backlinks? My buddy Ferry has a perfect solution for you. How much do you think this digital PR campaign is worth? Wait just one minute before you answer. Watch as we hijack the news, we tell you Swift and Barbie to get you the links. Now we can take this data set from ONS and paste it right into your emails to get you the links. Now how much do you think this campaign is worth? Don't answer! Wait until you see Bloomberg, BBC, Forbes, top tier national and regional news outlets. Reactive PR, data PR, expert commentary, over 70 team members at your disposal. This product is so hot I need a fan! And then Listen to what campaigns we do at no extra charge. Gain character wages, bananas and sleep, best days for dogs, luckiest UK areas, and many more. All for just how much did you guess? 10,000? 20,000? Even more? No! It's just 5,500 pounds. That's right. It's five and a half grand. It's an incredible value, but it's true. It's digital PR from Search Intelligence. Order today. P.O. Box. Searchintelligence.co.uk. Except B to B clients. Daniel is one of the best SEOs in the UK. He's been in the SEO industry since 1999 and during the mid 2000s, Daniel worked on some of the UK's largest SEO agencies. He's in the lead SEO for Certive and also runs independent SEO consultancy. He's the founder of SEO Stacks IO, SEO Audits IO. Please welcome Daniel Foley Carter. Daniel, my man, welcome back to the show. Hey, Trey, how are you? Doing good, doing good. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Let's give a round of applause. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right, Daniel. This is the, the welcome back to the show. Uh, it's been what almost three years now since you were first on here, and you have some great stuff that you're going to share with us. I mean, you launched a few con a few projects yourself, which we'll talk about. But before we get to that, this is the first question I ask all my SEO professionals that come on here in one minute or less. How does Daniel get ranking on page one of Google? So I create content that matters. I focus on building brand and trust. I use SEO testing. I do query counting and I test oh. and test and test until I find what seems to give a positive ranking signal. And then I capitalize on that. And that has always been the way that I found how to rank for all of the different things that I've wanted to rank for, be it for my own personal projects, from scooter guides to my consultancy site, through to ranking for like online gambling, casino, high CPC terms that are incredibly competitive. Ooh. So that's pretty much like the very top level, uh, but I can obviously delve into a lot <laughs> more detail. But, um... Love it, love it. First knowledge bomb of today. Hold on, let's rewind this real quick. Hold on. Take us way back, way back to 1999. How'd you first get into SEO? So funny story, very quick. Okay. Um, I got a computer, didn't know what to do with it. I was only a kid and I figured out you could play games on it. Doom. Yeah. Uh, then the internet, the internet came along. So I started, you know, going on the internet and I realized I wanted to make money. So. I actually learned how to program. I learned to write programs in Visual Basic. Oh. I was like, I'm going to sell these. So I need a website. So I built a website. I was like, I need people to come to my website. Yep. So at the time, there was Hotbot, Lycos, Alta Vista, uh, Dogpile, Angel Fire, GeoCities, you know, oh, yeah. there were like million search engines. So it was like, I built a site to sell my VB6 applications. Uh, uh, and then it was like getting them listed in search engines. And then from that point onwards, uh, the best thing was at the time, this is way before Google Analytics or anything like that, you used to get like a little counter. Oh, yeah. At the bottom of your website. <laughs> and I used to have that there. And then I used to come back and check on it, how many people have come to my website. Uh, but no one ever brought the software. Uh, <laughs> it's a long, long time ago. Oh, man. I remember that. I think, I think I think the one I used was like Hitbox or something like that. It was like a little thing that you just have yeah, in the yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you had Hitbox, uh, you had Urchin. Oh, yeah, uh, Urchin. Used be, uh, used to be Urchin, and then Google brought Urchin out. Yeah. Um, and then you used to get, like, with your uh, hosting company, some hosting companies used to give you, like, a little back-end control panel with stats oh, yeah. for your website. Like, one-on-one -on -one used to do it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was all, like, really basic back then. And, um, you know, for me, I was highly, highly motivated at a young age to start selling stuff online. Mm -hmm. So... I sort of got in around the dot com boom time. Okay. Uh, but obviously, I was too young at, at, at that particular time. I didn't have the same skill set. But, uh, you know, and I started doing SEO, like even before Yahoo and MSN were like the key players mm -hmm. for Google coming. Uh, and that's really what sort of started me on the SEO path. Love that. Love that. So, I mean, I know back then, I mean, how'd you actually learn it then? I mean, like back then, there's not that many resources. I mean, were you going to like forums? Were you like following anyone? Like share us your like sources of um, yeah, how you learned so, it. So really in the early days, uh, mm -hmm. there was a lot less to it. It was it was super basic. So uh, it was a case of best practice. Best practice was enough mm -hmm. to get you a long way. So for example, Back in the day, it would be search engines were so basic, they would just pattern match keywords. So people would create doorway pages, put keywords in every element on the page. Marquee tags used to get spammed. So it was more of a case that I just looked at very early day resources mm -hmm. for. So back in the day, when you wanted to get indexed by search engines like Alta Vista, uh, FreeServe, and all, all of the other, they actually, when you go on the search engine it would be like submit your website oh, yeah and on it on it it would actually ask you questions you know what keywords is your website relevant to so it was like you were telling the search engine what your content was relevant for and it would store that against your website and that was it and it was like <laughs> it was like you know really early days seo was so basic because even html then you know it wasn't that complex you didn't have anywhere near as much of the standards that you do now so you could create a doorway page shove your keyword in it just a hundred times and that would increase your rank but fundamentally funnily enough 
back in the early days, uh, Lynx, Lynx played a part then too, mm -hmm. uh, because early search crawlers just had Lynx and that was mm -hmm. it. So uh, that's fundamentally what sort of cemented the foundations for me. Uh, and then obviously, I've been around as search engines have changed. I've been around. I watched Yahoo get crushed by oh, Google. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I saw the transition of search. Um, and it was sad, you know, saying goodbye to Ask Jeeves and all of the other, <laughs> the other little search <laughs> engines. And it, it is sad. Like, even as an SEO today, I don't think Google should have been allowed to become what it is. I think uh -huh. it's far too much of a monopoly and there should be a far more competitive landscape for search. Uh, maybe SGE might piss off enough people to <laughs> to, <laughs> to give uh, market share back to, to to Bing with Copilot. Who knows? Oh, there we go. Love that. Love that. I'd love to um, talk about your latest projects. I mean, uh, over three years ago, you, you you didn't have these projects, but the two projects that you have going on is SEOaudits.io and SEOStack.io. Let's talk about SEO audits yeah. first. What, what, what's, what's SEO audits about? Okay, all right, so long story short is obviously me like any SEO business, you know, I get clients come, they wanna talk about SEO, um, you know, and, and you know, they will submit an inquiry and then I'll say to them, you know, what have you been doing? What work have you had done? They'll send me a previous audit. And obviously I've seen it years and years and years and you would always get the, the same usual stuff appear over and over again in an audit and it got to the point where like, nine out of 10 audits that was getting sent. It was just the same automated thing with a different logo on it mm -hmm. or different explanations of why you shouldn't have this problem and why it's bad. And it just got to the point where I was like, you know what? There's got to be a big gap in the market for just focusing specifically on giving a company an audit that's like, here is everything that is wrong. And realistically, for you to actually go on to achieve what you want, here's you know, what you're going to need to do. Mm -hmm. And it stops this whole SEO merry-go-round. So one of the biggest problems in the industry is SEO as it's uh, as a skill is one of those things where it's easy for people to talk about it. But when you actually get people to do it, mm -hmm. it's a different thing. So when you get the mixed expertise and then you get businesses that, uh, you know, missold a service or they, their expectations aren't managed, you end up with this whole uh, industry where clients bounce from one business to another looking for an SEO solution. And then you get people that are using automation with crawls and, you know, here's why you shouldn't have 404s, blah, blah, blah. So the audit business come up really as a way of saying, look, if you want SEO, rather than you afford and pay an agency, you know, we'll tear everything apart. We'll give you a proper assessment and we'll say to you, look, this is a realistic overview of where you are and what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And whether you or not have the budget for it. And the other thing to take into consideration is we weren't just looking at the website. We were looking at, are these businesses viable for what they want to rank for? Mm -hmm. So we would get like clothing companies uh -huh. that had a very limited high end range wanting to rank for terms with competitors with a much greater range of products. They'd never had a business tell them, hold on, your product's not uh you know you're not competitive you're not going to rank for these things mm -hmm. so that was the audits business i set it up basically to like throw a spanner in the works to help businesses rather than they carry on going through the merry-go-round they get a full assessment and then they can work out whether or not you know they they actually want to go ahead and you know try to rank and generate some revenue from it love that love that so i'm curious uh with your audits are they uh how do you how do you price your audits i mean is it by like how big the website is or you know or do you have one yeah. one set one price or how does it work yeah so it it's a little bit different we're actually about to change the pricing model because okay. uh the 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 business is very bespoke um mm. we try to have like a uniform package system but it is really difficult because there's just so much variation between each site each mm -hmm. business but generally what we've typically done is we've taken an audit, put like a minimum checklist of all the things that we'll typically look for. And then we'll say, you know, if your site is this size, it's going to be a lot more work. Mm -hmm. So we'll price more. But what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have like a standardized model, but we're going to do a, a custom pricing where, you know, we will take a look at actually, you know, what the business is. Uh, what their site looks like, and then we'll give a more real-time assessment for quote quoting. Because, again, anything with SEO is really hard to package because it's just too many variables in it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and even, you know, even myself, I experience it. You know, I set out prices for an audit and, you know, uh, you know, I've had like a few audits booked mm-hmm. and, you know, they booked a behemoth audit and I was like, great. And then when I look at the site and look how much data there is and I'm like, there's no way <laughs> I should have done this for the price that I did. But yeah, you know, there it is. Love that. Love that. Okay. Now your next project, which is pretty cool too. I started to see you doing, it's like more of a, more of a SaaS product, right? It's, it's like a SEO stack dot IO. Yes. Yeah. This is, this has been the most painful thing I've ever gone through in my life. I've been through painful stuff. Um, <laughs> So basically, so basically, like long story short, right? So if I took SEO as a balloon and I said to people in the SEO balloon, what things do most people talk about in SEO, right? And you're going to hear all the usual crawling, but you'll hear SEMrush, Ahrefs, uh, uh, SE ranking, Sitebulb, and all these other tools. But the biggest thing is that Search Console is the best tool in yeah. respect you get the actual data Mm -hmm. but the problem is with search console is that you don't get the data so google holds the data but you don't get it through the search console interface so you've got to use looker studio search analytics for sheets you can get the data but there's no real environment where you can replicate gsc Mm -hmm. so i got so fed up i was like there's got to be a better solution so i was like why don't we rebuild search console take away all the limitations and then integrate it with a project management system, AI workflow system. And that's exactly what I've been doing for the last two and a half to three years. And if I could give anyone any advice, because I know in an industry, when someone builds something and it looks like it's going to boom, someone else will go and make it. Let me tell you now, there's a very good reason why people haven't rebuilt Google search console. Sadly, I've learned the hard way. Oh man, love that, love that, and can't wait to see once everything is going. I mean, it's, it's available now, right? People can 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 log in, or can we go in yet? So, right. so uh, yeah, uh, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mixed one. So the okay. problem problem that we had is is that uh, many people know that I've been announcing it forever, and they're not releasing the product, and it's not been something that I would have done in foresight. Uh-huh. Basically, we made version one of it, and it worked, and people were using it. I had, I think, 300 people at one point using it. Uh, But the problem was it was too slow. It was too buggy. So we scrapped the architecture and we restarted again. But what we built now is like high end works perfectly. But we've just because of the process now, we've had a lot more testing. Mm -hmm. So I have got people using it, but it's by invite only. Um, We were due to go live at the end of February and then the end of March. But we are literally now finally at the point where we're about to go live. Mm-hmm. So people will be able to sign up uh, and start using it very, very shortly. And uh, I'm actually, over the next couple of days, I'm about to invite the first group of people to start using it at a commercial level. Excellent! Love that, love that. Okay, let's get into our topic of today. It's basically how to pretty much recover from Google algorithm updates or even prevent yourself from um, actual updates. I mean, let's first go about understanding the impact. Can you explain how to uh, uh, accurately assess the impact of a core update on a website? Well, so the the interesting thing here is that uh, with a lot of Google core updates, obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, a website will get you know, uh, hit by core update, but there are loads of nuances to this. So okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop from yes. my analysis. So obviously we know that there's different updates that rolls out. So we have general core updates, which generally focus on EAT refinements as well as other things. We have spam updates, and the spam updates are compartmentalized. So you have general spam, which just looks at you know typical on-site spam. You have spam brain, which is the link side of Google spam evaluation. Uh, then you have specific updates that really hone in on certain aspects of content. So uh, Google helpful content uh, being a primary one at the minute, which obviously, so the main ones that Google really have been gunning on are spam and helpful content. And both of those try to tackle both sides of the issue at the minute with things like Parasite SEO uh, and AI pure spam. Mm-hmm. Most sites that get hit, typically what you'll find and what a lot of people will find 
is that because of how Google rolls these updates out, you go back and look over the last few years with uh, uh, update history, you'll find Google will do like a early in the year general core update, like a, a, a broad core update in February or March. Yep. And then it will and then it will drop another update and then towards the latter part of the year they'll do something bigger like a helpful content update so what a lot of sites tend to see is they'll get hit by one update and then they'll wait or they'll panic and then on the next core update or a core update later in the year they'll see recovery and some attribute their uh, recovery to things that they did and some do nothing freeze and see recovery anyway mm-hmm. but there are there are so many aspects to getting hit by a core update. Like we could talk all day, but I'm gonna do like a TLDR. Okay. So okay. so the type of update that you get hit by obviously is gonna have the biggest difference. And the way in which it hits your site is gonna be indicative of how much pain you're gonna go through. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if Google drops a spam update like the March update that's just gone by. And that is an outlier because Google never ever drop articles talking about how they're refining search as a part of the update. Google don't do that. So the update that just rolled by is more like Panda, Penguin style kamikaze on uh, on spam. And they've done that because they've been publicly embarrassed. You've got Lily Ray, uh, doing an amazing job highlighting just how much crap there is in search results. People are literally uh, hitting LinkedIn and creating parasite SEO yep. articles that are outranking. So with these updates, like the March update, uh, you typically find sites will get just wiped out. Yep. There's not like a little bit of impact. It's all or nothing, right? So the March update is very much that. You had a lot of uh, AI sites that just were de-indexed completely or they lost like 95% plus of their traffic. And what that is, is if Google just looks at all of the signals mm-hmm. and it's clear that a majority of the site clearly is just engineered to rank, rather than Google pick, you know, that bit of the site's good, that bit of the site's not, it will just say, no, screw you, we're going to take the site out. But if we look at other updates like, you know, general core updates, what sites that get hit will typically find is they will just see a part of their site lose rank. So okay. some of their site will retain rank, some of it will lose it. Um, the hardest updates to recover from are helpful content updates. And the reason for that is because once you get hit, even if you go back and start fixing things, there's generally like a signal indicator. And that signal indicator means that that content, just because you go and fix it, it's not just going to rank. There needs to be trust rebuilt in the site. Oh. Oh. So it's, I, you know, because I audit sites like that get hit all, all the time, been hit by numerous updates over the years. And if you do anything that leads to like manual actions or consistent manual actions, for example, uh, those sites, when they get hit by updates, they take even longer to recover, uh, much longer to recover. They can take years to recover. And even though this is not confirmed, I've seen it so many times. If you get uh, a site that gets hit and it's consistently been spamming Google and then recovering, spamming Google and mm-hmm. recovering, it's like they put a marker on the domain and then that site will then tank and will not recover. Even if you clear out all the spam you disavow any bad links you revamp all the content the domain just does not come back to life um the easiest updates to come back from are general core updates uh eat refinements where you might see you know your blogs lose a bit of traction because you know google's maybe identified that you know certain aspects of your content are less trustworthy or there's not as much expertise um, those ones are typically quicker to re- uh, to resolve from. Love that, love that. Love so I'm, that. Ooh, I'm hearing echo. Okay, oh, there it's gone. Okay, um, I'm curious. Like, what are some uh, common signs that you, that you that a website has been negatively um, affected by an update? What are some key things that you kind of look at real quick? Like, okay, yeah, you got hit by an update. Well, the, the obviously the first immediate thing is uh, loss of clicks, impressions, average position. Um, so the most common one, obviously, is you're going to see your traffic tank. 
you're going to see your clicks and impressions and average position all tank together. Mm. Uh, the other one is finding that loads of content is no longer indexed. So that's going to be the next indicator. So the one thing that I would always advise, if someone decides, you know, uh, to, to do some checks, they realize that their ranks have dropped. Uh, Google Search Console should be where everyone goes, irrespective. And what you should do is you should, after an update has come and it looks like you've been hit, wait for at least 28 days okay. from the point where the update finishes. Okay, so Google offer their search updates page. Mm -hmm. When the update is finished, allow 28 days to roll by. And then what you do is you do uh, last 28 days versus 28 days before the update. So you've got your 28 days either side, mm -hmm. and then you can export and see all the pages that were hit. And then what you should be doing is you should look at the extent of how many of those pages have been hit in proportion to your site size. So if you've got a thousand page site mm -hmm. and 800 pages have lost clicks, that is typically indicative of a wider issue with the domain with overall trust. Whereas if you've got a page with a thousand, if you've got a domain with a thousand pages, but 50 pages have lost traction and the others haven't, that's more likely tied to EAT issues with, with the content. But long story short, if you see clicks, impressions, and average position all go down together, mm -hmm. that's typically indicative that you've been hit. You see clicks drop, but you see impressions and average position sustain. Mm -hmm. What that generally means is that your page might have slipped a few positions for a lot of the traffic generating terms. So your clicks drop, but your impressions and average position stay. Uh -huh. and that's something called slippage. That's easier to do love that love that okay so i'm curious like what so what in your experience what type of content have you seen being um most affected by the recent updates well it's no secret ai content yeah. has been has been one of them mm. but actually uh what i'm seeing a lot of is just non-value pages so uh i'll start top to bottom from what i've seen the most so uh ai content obviously has been at the top of the pack so I've seen AI content just get absolutely annihilated all over the place. Not everywhere. Not all AI, AI content is bad. Secondly, secondly, <clears throat> excuse me. Secondly is uh, thin content or content that just really doesn't fit the profile of the search where that content might have ranked previously, has held on for as long as it could, but then got wiped out. Uh, and then the next content after that is content that is clearly created for SEO. So I see it more and more. I'm seeing it a lot more with e-commerce sites that have just just been creating content for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. Those have been getting hit. Uh, and those are the main uh, types of content that I'm seeing getting hit. One thing that is really clear recently is that if content looks like it's created for search, uh, and there's enough data to support that uh, user behavior clearly shows that that content isn't paying, being paid attention to. Those two things together often lead to uh, Google devaluing and, and in many cases, de-indexing that content. Love that. Okay, so I'm curious now, like, could you walk us through a process of creating a recovery plan if, say, we got, we got hit that addresses, you know, kind of like the both um, you know, short-term fixes and long-term you know, strategies? So the first thing, whenever I see a site that's been hit, mm -hmm. what I do is I crawl the site. So I crawl the site, I get a full export of all the pages, and I will put that to the side. What I will then do is I'll take a look at specifically what update has hit. But then I go back and I look historically to see does this site have a habit of being hit by previous updates? Okay. Because if I see consistently that the site has gone through uh, numerous times where it's been hit, then I'm going to start questioning what they've been doing in terms of content, links, user experience in the past. So what I do is I scope out what update hit, what that update is, 
is it a link update is okay. it a general core update is it a helpful content update is it a spam update product reviews update once i've established what that update is i then make a note of that and then i'll park that and then i'll go back and see if it's been effect affected by other updates then what i'll do is i will just rule out technical issues because you would be surprised lots of sites get hit at an update and then i go and look from a tech perspective and i just find loads of basic silly mistakes that i know uh, I'll give you one example i saw a site that got absolutely wiped out by august update last year mm -hmm. and it's because they like made 90 percent of their internal link structure appended with utm links and i was just like who made that decision mm -hmm. so i ruled out tech issues so all the usual ones I make sure that the page can be rendered I can make sure that all of the output is accessible for Google. Uh, it used to be that I checked caches, but obviously Google got rid of that. And once I've ruled out tech issues that I know would impede the page being evaluated in some way, then I go and look at things like consistency uh, and cannibalization. So I want to rule out that pages haven't lost ground because of mass cannibalization problems. <laughs> then what I'll do once i've established okay you know this site has been hit by uh let, let's say a, a eat general core update mm -hmm. then from my crawl i do what's called a segment analysis so a segment analysis is your website is made up of lots of subfolders whether it's blog collections products articles knowledge base news whatever your subfolders are i will then go through gsc and I will do a, a 28 day and three month pre and post check to compare both periods across each subfolder. So I then know by subfolder where the main hits have been. Okay. Then when I've established all of those hits, I will start with the worst affected first. And the first thing that I'll do after that is something called query count. So I'll give you a basic premise. You have a page on your site. Mm -hmm. It's indexed. Google's serving it. Okay. If you take a page in your site and you put it into the search console, exact URL, and you go to the bottom of your query table, it'll say 1 to 10 of 500, 1 to 10 of 800, 1 to 10 of 1,000. Uh -huh. Now, this is one of the reasons why I built SEO stack. I will look at the queries that a page is served for and how many queries are served for. If I see pre and post update, that there's been a massive shrink in queries. Mm -hmm. What that tells me is that Google's devalued the content, which is why it's not serving anymore. There's two key principles that I teach people when I do my SEO webinars, and that's devaluation and slippage. So I'll give you a scenario. If you have a page with a thousand queries and it loses 80% of its traffic, and then when you check, it's only lost 10% of its queries, You'd be like, well, if it's only lost a small amount of queries, why did it lose so much traffic? Well, it might be that loads of stuff that ranked number one slipped to position four. So if, if let's say 500 of those queries were in positions one to three and they're now four to 10, the clicks are going to nosedive. If the page is still being served the same amount by Google, Google's still valuing the content, but there are other factors that have led to position slip could be trust, could be SERP features. So when I establish whether something has been devalued or slipped, that then sets the course for my next evaluation. If I see devaluation, what I then do is I look for devaluation and how many pages that lost then suffer devaluation. If I see most of the pages have been devalued, then I start taking a look at content quality across the key offending pages take a look at the SERP and then I will perform a link audit to see you know were links devalued and then the other content quality update come along and then just wiped it out and typically what I will then do is once I've got all of the data sets and then I've worked out whether it's devaluation slippage I'll then put together a recovery plan okay. that is based on SEO testing and that SEO testing plan will basically depend on how much of the site's been impacted, what the update is. So with SEO testing, what it will typically boil down to is changing navigation architecture, 
refining link equity distributions pages, cleaning up index. If I could give anyone advice now, one thing that's affecting so many sites and people aren't talking about it enough is Google is indexing less than 50% of content that it would index five, 10 years ago. Oh, and I, so, uh, I, so another bit of insight that I could give, right? So I'm going to do like really top level. Google is a company that has a carbon footprint. They have data centers. They, they must consume terawatts of energy with Google data centers. So basically, if we wind ourselves back, Google is paying to store all of the indexes for every website that it finds. Billions and trillions of results, petabytes of data. But then how many of those results is Google ever going to serve? What is the point in storing websites that you're never going to serve? There is no point. And it has a carbon footprint because ultimately the more data Google has to process, the more it has to store, the more energy they use, the more it costs them. So what does Google do? Google will crawl a site, crawl a piece of content, make detriment as to whether or not this content actually meets a various set of standards. You've got EAT, YMYL, loads of other things that it will look at, uh, as well as uh, encompassing domain performance and history. If Google sees that this content doesn't really look like we're ever going to serve it, they won't index it. So what you're seeing now, it's harder for people to get content indexed. Mm-hmm. And it's dropping content from indexing at an astonishing rate. So what happens is, is that if you've got a website that's been hit by a core update, go and have a look at how much content is actually indexed. I've been seeing sites, not only have they had their pre-existing pages wiped out, but they've seen loads of content de-indexed because Google doesn't see any value in it. Man, there was a lot just mentioned right there, guys. You, you need to rewind that whole 10, maybe 10 minutes right there of great stuff, great information. I want to go into more of, um, uh, I'm curious now, like, let's say like once you actually found, uh, let's maybe take an example. You don't have to share the brand or site or anything like that, but let's say you found you found something, you found that they were hit by a helpful content update. What, what were like um, some of the things that you did to actually bring them back um, like um, from, from a helpful content update? So, uh, uh, so I was working with a casino site that got absolutely decimated by helpful content update. Um, so some of the things that I did, uh, post audit was I did a, an, an index cleanup. So by an index cleanup, I got all of the pages that weren't indexed over GSC API. Uh, it took me like three weeks because Google only gives you a thousand URLs through GSC interface a day and screaming frog and he gives you 2000 URLs a day unless you do subfolders. But basically I like found all the content that wasn't being indexed. I looked at the value of it. I looked in GA4 and legacy GA to see, you know, were people actually using this content? No one was. So all of the content that just wasn't adding any value. I went back to the client. I was like, look, we're going to get rid of this. Doesn't add any value. It saps link equity. And then I was checking that non-value content for external links to redirect anything that had external links. Mm. So I shrank their index. And then what was there in their index, I then started looking at uh, how much value that content had. And the way that I did that was the query counting process. Uh, Then what I was doing, so I was going through all the content, looking at query serve rates. And then what I would do is I was using a tool called InLinks which is a natural language processing content auditing tool. Uh, So I was taking a look at the content and a lot of the content that they had been producing was clearly like over-engineered to rank. Mm -hmm. Um, So one really good thing that you you can do is if you take a look at word count by position in SERP, word count is not a ranking factor, but word count is an interesting factor because it gives you an idea of how much content sites have to satisfy an end user's intent so it's like if someone goes to a page because they want to play a game or they want to do something they're not going to read four thousand words of content and it's not like in the past sorry about the background noise Uh, it's not like in the past where google would you know just rank something because it was like really in depth 
now now we've got behavioral signals because Google doesn't understand the context of content. Uh, that antitrust trial still showed that Google cannot fully understand documents, okay? So user behavior is a factor. If user behavior clearly shows 30 seconds engagement time on a page with 4,000 words, well, that clearly says that that 4,000 words is not of any value. Mm -hmm. So what I was doing was I, uh, I said to the client, like loads of the content looks over-optimized, it's too much there. I set up Microsoft Clarity, could see that people were never scrolling down. So I went back to the client, regenerated the NLP briefs, shortened the content and condensed it. <laughs> and do you know the principle where you could say like, you could condense 20 words to 10 words, but still have the same meaning in the content? Yeah. We did content compression. Uh, we checked the context of the content, we made sure it was uh, helpful. And one other way that you can make sure content is helpful is you can use AlsoAsk.com. You put your keyword in, it will get all of the PAA data, people also ask data, feed that into chat GPT, ask it to look for patterns in the data. And then you can then use that as what's called content priority. So if someone's interested in something, if you serve them content in a priority order that most people care about, they're going to engage for longer and that's going to trigger that's going to be like positive helpful content signals so part of the recovery i help content consolidate and condense content uh uh readjust their pages and probably about nine months after we started the exercises they started to see recovery wow i think that's like a <laughs> That's a million dollar tip right there. I love that. Love that. Oh my God, guys. I mean, that's a real cute knowledge bomb there. We got our first question in the um, uh, live audience here. We have, what have you learned recently while doing a backlinks audit by Emily? Uh, well, yeah, I do a lot of link audits. Uh, so what have I learned? Well, Google spam updates, uh, spam brain updates clearly haven't caught up to a lot of mass link spam yet. So um, what have I learned? So I've learned that link spam still works, unfortunately, and it will continue to work for a long period of time. Um, I've also learned that the most valuable links are typically links that come from uh, pages that have traffic. So the more weighted metric for anyone to use when they're focusing on their link acquisition strategy is not DR, DA, CFTF or anything like that. If a page has some projected traffic, you can bet that. So Ahrefs and SEMrush work by scraping. So they scrape. When they scrape, they see where pages are on that scrape by position. They use them. They then have an algorithmic formula to calculate projected traffic by result. And that's how they come up with their traffic forecasts. So if a page has any forecasted traffic, the probability is, is that that real traffic is a lot higher. If a page has traffic, that means that the content in that page is good, which means better affinity, which means that you're more likely to receive link equity from it than something that has a high artificially inflated popularity metric. Because Google doesn't use DA, DF, D, uh, TA, uh, DA, CF, or any of these metrics. Um, the other thing as well uh, is that from a lot of the testing that I did. Uh, it also looks like as part of the over optimization for content or creating content for SEO, uh, they're still a multifaceted link strategy. So what you need, you need to use a platform like uh, featured.com. Uh, it's the equivalent of Harrow. Uh, I wouldn't use Harrow or anything from Cision because they really uh, do not want SEOs using their platform to earn links. Uh, and they've made that clear. Uh, so it used to be called Turkle, Turkle. it's now called featured.com. Mm -hmm. So basically your strategy should be uh, uh, pitch and earn. So you pitch a contribution in terms of a thought uh, to someone, a journalist, they'll include it in a skyscraper piece of content along with others. Uh, those are gonna be your links to your root domain. So you wanna have a flow of those. You wanna do intermittent digital PR. Usually every three to six months, you should do one digital PR campaign that will lead to a flurry of higher authority links. It will gener generate some uh, brand citation. Mm. And then you want mixed vetted niche edit strategy. Uh, with the vetted niche, niche edit strategy, 
really need to be picky about uh, domains and their history. So one thing I always advocate is if you're picking like niche edits, always find a domain that doesn't have a, a history of tanking uh, or excessive outbound link profile, loads of irrelevant content. Um, and then generally, uh, social baiting is also another uh, really good way to earn links. So create something that you know in the industry is something that people would value. Use paid social to get that out. Oh. So you switch the page and then you can encourage and attract natural links that way. And then you've got the old legacy routes of link reclamation, which should be things like uh, you'll have 404 pages over time that will accrue links. Uh, one tip for anyone watching, you can do this right now. Go into your Google search console, go into page indexing under not indexed, where it says not found 404, click on that, export that 404 list, then go to Ahrefs, top menu under more, click that, click on batch analysis, and then take your 404 URLs, 200 at a time, put it into the batch analysis, and I bet you find links that have got broken pages that have got external links. So your uh, niche will depend on the kind of links that you want to go for. Obviously, adult gaming casino niches are much harder to get links from. So it really depends on your niche. But the link strategy that I've just advised is applicable to most niches. Wow, <laughs> you're dropping some knowledge bombs today, Daniel. Love it. And we are at time. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, and maybe if, if, if quick, if you can quickly answer this question, because I, I kind of want to ask this question and before I ask my very last question. It's like, I mean, what are some like emerging trends that you see in signals that you believe that will be important for like in SEO now, especially like, you know, paying attention to the near future with AI and stuff like that? What's the one thing that you should we should be looking at? Well, it's clear that it's, it's, it's clear that, you know, the world is changing uh, with AI probably not at the speed that people have assumed clearly because of the fact that we've seen the boom in AI use and there are not enough discussions being had about number one, the implications of AI uh, and number two, things that are really important within AI that get lost. So I'm going to do some really top level things that I think are really important. First of all, for anyone that's watching uh, who you know, doesn't really have a full concept of what AI is, but understands that, you know, you can use it to write content. Mm -hmm. Go and read what large language models are. Learn about what la large language models are. And you'll realize that when you're asking ChatGPT or, or Claude or any of these other LLMs to write you an article on something, they're not writing new content. They're rewriting something that they were already trained on. Now, let me tell you why this is a big problem. And I hope you love this. I love talking about this, right? I'm going to drop something that I hope is revolutionary. <laughs> oh, is watching. Listen to this. Okay, I'm going to give you an analogy. I'm at home. I want to make a lemon cheesecake. Okay? I don't know how to cook, but I want a recipe for a lemon cheesecake. Does Google need to serve me 5 million lemon cheesecake recipes? No, it doesn't. So, if I have page one with recipes for lemon cheesecakes if i go to google and say uh, if i go to chat gpt and say write me a lemon cheesecake recipe and then i copy the content and i pull it on my food blog why is google going to rank content that already technically exists mm -hmm. so this is what is happening there is a process called information gain if you want to rank for something should you not be giving people new value that doesn't already exist? So Google, the spam updates are hitting sites that are just abusing AI content. There's not necessarily anything wrong with AI content. You know, it's not putting out bad quality content. I've seen AI write amazing articles. The problem is that you are asking Google to index and serve content that already exists however many times over. You're not adding any new value. And what Google is actually looking for is not that you've taken an article from ChatGPT and put it on your website. It's looking at, well, 80% of this site is new articles of content that already exists. This is not a value. We're not going to serve this. And that pattern of doing that looks spammy. So modern SEO, as Google evolves, is going to be looking more at information gain frameworks 
personalization and obviously machine learning. So here's how I think search is going to change. Machine learning and data and AI together will allow Google to look at how people are interacting with content, what people are doing, and it can provide more personalized results based on behavior. Rather than looking at traditional metrics like links, if Google can ascertain that something is good for someone because their behavior indicates positively, that's going to change SEO from making your H1 have a keyword in it, optimizing, you know, uh, keywords in your page and using NLP briefs and all the rest of it. What it's going to do is it's going to say, well, if people clearly are behaving in a way that uh, says that your content's no good, doesn't matter what you write about. If your page is bad, it's bad. So user experience is going to play a far more intrinsic part of SEO moving forwards. And I think how people get information is going to change. We can see that with SGE. What SGE is doing is it's bringing more to the front line in search, which some could argue will increase zero click searches. But I don't think it's going to be the Armageddon that people are making out it out to be. Um, but I do think it's really going to make people work harder to create content of value. So moving forwards, the one thing I would be advocating for people to do is don't create content for the sake of it. And don't create content using a, a writing tool. You know, don't get me wrong, tools out there like Surfer and InLinks and all these other tools, they're great. But don't go creating content and then focusing on a content score. That's a load of rubbish. Don't do that. What you should do is find out what people actually care about and then orientate your content and output in a way that, you know, user behavior is going to say, well, clearly this is doing its job. And that brings me back to the last point. You could create an amazing website. You have amazing content. But if you've got a non-competitive product, the behavior is going to tell Google that your site is no good. Let me give you an analogy. Go to Google and type in cheap trainers. The first result that comes up, it's a beautiful website, high quality links, great brand, but it has five pairs of trainers on it and they're not overly cheap. The behavior is going to be high level of pogo. Okay. Mm -hmm. So no amount of on-site SEO or links is going to save that. People are going to go to the next result where there's 10,000 pairs of cheap trainers. And if that site with 10,000 pairs of cheap trainers is constantly converting and ending the session, you're not going to displace that with any on-site SEO strategy or link strategy. So I, that would be my advice moving forwards. Make people-centric content in a high-quality framework. Man, love it, love it. We are at time, guys. And this is the last question, if you can answer this real quick. If someone wants to get if someone wants to get into the SEO game, become an SEO professional themselves, what's your advice for them? Um, well, I'm a little bit biased there because I sell SEO webinars that teach people. But okay. uh, it would always be go and buy a domain, set up a little piece of hosting, um, it's really hard. There are some great people out there. There's, uh, I think it's learningseo.io, which is by Alida Solis, uh, which is a really good resource for beginners. Um, uh, Mark Williams Cook of Candor, he has a, a really good uh, fundamentals course as well. But there's loads of really great resources out there for people to follow. But if I could tell, teach anyone anything in SEO, is practice makes perfect. Love that. And for those that do want to learn from you, from your, your, your SEO webinars, how can people get a hold of you? How can people uh, find these webinars? Yeah, sure. It's seo-audits.io. Okay. And under the webinars menu, there's a webinars bundle. And it basically has like 40 hours, 40 hours now of SEO video that I teach pretty much everything that I, that I know. Love it, love it, guys. And if you found this episode so helpful, imagine what you could find in 40 hours of training from Daniel. Man, I learned so much today. Thank you so much. Everyone give a round of applause. So Daniel, can you hold on for one quick second while I sign off? Just hold on for one quick second. All right, guys. That was a great episode. If, please, uh, if you liked the episode, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And don't forget to visit our sponsors, seonitro.com and search-intelligence.co.uk. Until next time, I will see you guys in two weeks. I'll be out in a conference next week. So see you in two weeks. Thank you for
for watching. Hope you come back next week. Make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a thing. Hope you learn something new because the vibe is incredible. From the special SEO professionals, SEO video show. Let's work. Want to see you be an SEO expert. Paul Andre DeVera helping you step it up. No delay right now. Time to level up. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe. Woo! Yeah, yeah.